Welcome to the Code with Jason meetup. Today, we're here with a new mentee, Jonathan. Jonathan, welcome. Hi, how are you? Uh, yeah, my name's Jonathan. You? Doing good. Uh, just starting uh, my journey on Ruby on Rails. Got really interested in uh, seeing how some of my favorite websites were made, so I'd take an interest in it. Picked up a book and uh, uh, I'd try to give it a shot. Awesome. Um, and where are you located? Uh, Kentucky. Okay. Where in Kentucky? Louisville, to be exact. Oh, okay. I visited there. Quite enjoyed it. Um, okay. And apologies if I wasn't paying attention just now, but can you, can you give me, um, a little bit of your, your background, how long you've been programming and stuff like that? Uh, started about two years ago, uh, enrolled at the university for computer engineering computer science uh right now i'm in my junior year i got about a year left gotta start looking for some co-ops some internships so thought i'd try to diversify some of my skill sets by learning rails yeah yeah i think that's a good idea um a lot of the stuff they teach you in school is obviously quite theoretical and there can be very little overlap between what you learn in school and then what employers want you to know. So that seems like a good idea to, to start learning some of that stuff before you graduate. Um, okay. So you're in your junior year. That means, well, it's, it's March. So I guess the school year will be ending relatively soon. And then you just have your, your senior year and then you're done. Um, do you, well, if you're going to graduate in four years, I know, Hardly anybody graduates in, in four right. years anymore. But anyway, do you have a feel for what you want to do once you once you graduate? Uh, no, not yet, actually. Uh, I'm starting to see that there's a whole bunch of different aspects that you can do with uh, programming and different fields and whatnot. So uh, there's web development, then there's like fintech. So I'm really interested to get like uh, understanding of all of it before I kind of get an idea of what I want. Yeah, okay. Okay. And do I remember correctly that you had some kind of personal project that you wanted to work on today? Uh, yeah, I wanted to uh, work on a uh, weather app. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Tell me about the app. So it was uh, inspired by like going on my phone, seeing I have an Apple and seeing how it was animated, how you can just go to it. You can look up all these different places. And it shows you like the wind patterns. It tells you like the uh, elevation and then even the terrain. So I would like to do something like that. Try to recreate something like that. Okay, great. Um, and what stage are you at with the development so far? Uh, right now, I've just got, started to learn how to use the API keys. So uh, right now, it's all in my head right now. So starting from the ground up today. Okay. Okay. Um, and have you gone as far as to like do Rails new and initialize the project that, that part? Yes, I have. Uh, I'm using a virtual server, so I have gotten all that installed and I'm good to go. Okay. Um, well, are you good with like sharing your screen and we can work on it some right now? Yeah, we can try that. Okay. Let me change the uh, permissions. Okay. You should be able to share now. In just a second. And let's see. Share screen. I see now. There we go. Okay, it says that you've started screen sharing. I don't see anything yet, but sometimes it takes a second. Let's see what you guys. Maybe you have the wrong screen set up. Okay, I can see it now. Oh, all right. Give it some time. Perfect. Okay, great. All right. So, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I was going to start a new project and then just start from there. And then uh, after with a little bit of guidance, then try to, after this session, try to work on it some more on my own. Okay, that sounds good. Mm -hmm. All right, so what do we want to start with? 
uh, I guess starting a start a new project. Okay. So, Rails new. Uh, let's call this uh other app. Uh, should I add like a CSS or uh, anything to this? A chance? Oh, I don't know. Honestly, like with with endeavors like this, like you'll probably not be happy with your first swing at it. Like <laughs> you'll probably build something and then realize there's all kinds of stuff you wish you would have done differently. And right. so I'm guessing you'll want to actually throw this away after you build some of it. So right. maybe let's not even worry about any of that kind of stuff because maybe it'll be easier just to build it and then decide what we don't like and blow it away and do it again. Perfect. And Jonathan, what made you decide to, to check out rails? Uh, it was just, a uh, a book that I picked up that I was just like skimming through, uh, hmm. Amazon's bestseller list. And I just so happened to see, a. Uh, Ruby on Rails tutorial. Okay. Which book was that? It was, uh, ooh. It was, it was Rails the Michael tutorial Hartle one. Mark, Michael Hartle, exactly. Okay. Yeah, that's a very popular starting point. Um, okay, so it looks like the initialization was successful. So, let's see. Should I just start it up? Real server? Yeah, why not? Host. The tab is in the way. So that's great. Let's do a window. So it looks like it was successful. Okay. And then one of the things I have trouble with is creating the route okay. uh, when I'm going through the program, I should say, or the the code okay i'll pull that up <clears throat> and then hopefully i can ask you a few questions on that okay um and what are some of the first things that you want this app to do hmm. first things that i want this app to do is I want it to have a spot where you can enter like a zip code. Mm -hmm. um, and then it will output a picture of like the current weather, like a, like a generic picture, like if it's sunny, just like the sun, cloudy, clouds, uh, rain, rain. And then a five day forecast. Okay. Okay. I would invite you to shoot for something even simpler for the first iteration. Okay. Can you think of a way that you can reduce the scope of that even further to make it even easier on yourself? Just as soon as you open it up, have one set location and it just shows you the temperature okay perfect yeah maybe it could show you like the current temper temperature for louisville or something like that yeah okay okay that seems like a good first objective um all right so what's the first step toward making that happen well let me 
try to open up my correct terminal and we can get that going mm -hmm. for my new yeah, close folder. Open folder. Most projects. So I'm going to share the VS Code uh, screen. Okay. <clears throat> Are you able to see that by chance? Yeah. Okay. So I guess what I'm trying to say is Whenever I start these projects, I know I have like the model view controllers of it, mm -hmm. but I don't know exactly what I am doing technically. Okay. Whenever I set up a new route to a home page. Okay. Does that make sense? I think so. Um, when and I set up that's another one of my problems. I don't know what technical terms is terms are. For example, uh, if I were to go to like the config tab and then go to routes, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how to get to the like a uh, make my local host link my local host page say hello world or something like that. Yeah. All right, I'm trying to think of of where we want to start. Mm -hmm. Um cuz I could just give you the answer but the answer might not help provide a lot of understanding. Okay. Cuz you can like, you know, line 9 there, it says root posts index. That's Correct. an example to say like you could set the root route to post index and that would take you to the post controller in the index action but maybe it's not obvious what happens um maybe it's not obvious like how that actually works mm -hmm. is that is that kind of the case yeah it's not obvious um so i believe this is the page or this is the that's the tab. Um, now, I know well, if I go me, to... Sorry yes. to interrupt. Um, yeah, go ahead and finish what you're going to say. I know I'm trying to get... I'm trying to make it to where my view is where it's going to say hello world. Mm -hmm. So I know it's going to be under the views tab and then the application i believe okay uh, um what's your current understanding of http very little okay okay um so there's a certain piece of documentation that might be helpful for you to look at um mm -hmm. it has something to do with a rails restful routing um maybe if you can just just google that it's like rails restful routing and rails restful resources okay and if you can show us your browser window maybe we can look at that documentation rails restful routing Yeah, and there's actually something else maybe we can look at first, but let's let's at least get that pulled up first. Yeah. It's on your screen. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Yeah, so there's this thing. Okay, so REST was invented by this guy whose name I don't remember. Maybe 
maybe if you can in a new tab search for like um rest http rest wikipedia Wikipedia. Yeah, let's go there. Uh, this one right here. Mm hmm. Okay. Oh, for some reason, it took us to the simple English Wikipedia. Let's let's go to the real one. I think we can handle the grown up version. All right. Right here. Well, that's just HTTP, not REST. Okay. That was simple. But if we scroll down a little bit, is it? There we go. And uh, we got. Okay, I guess that's. Uh... Yeah. All right. Is there a uh, an HTTP? Wow. I can't believe there's not a Wikipedia article for REST. Okay, let's just search for HTTP REST and see what comes up. Okay. Um, I don't like that first one. I don't like the second one. Let's scroll down a little more. Let's keep going. Man, I feel like the quality of articles online has just degraded so much <laughs> in the last 10 years or so. Um, Jonathan, are you a chat GPT user? I am not. Okay. Okay, let's just go to that first one there. What is the difference between HTTP and REST? And let's see what the most upvoted answer says. All right. This is so annoying. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. See that third comment with 13 upvotes? It has that link to Wikipedia. Yeah. Let's try that. Okay. Wow. So, so Bing couldn't find this for us for whatever reason, but it does exist. Okay. Let's read this. Um mm -hmm. REST is a software architectural style that was actually, instead of me reading it out loud, Jonathan, since, since this is for your benefit, how yeah. about you read like the first sentence or two aloud, how, however much you want, and then we can pause and reflect. Okay. Sounds great. Uh, REST represent representational state transfer is a software architectural style that was created to guide the design and development of the architecture for the World Wide Web. Okay, Rest let's pause there. Okay. Um, so when I'm reading technical documentation, mm -hmm. I usually like to read a sentence or so. And then I ask myself, did I understand what I just read? And if not, what exactly did I not understand? Um, so question for you, and if the answer is no, that's completely fine. Uh, did you understand that first sentence? Uh, let's see. That was created to guide. No, uh, software architectural style. Uh, kind of lost there, what that one means. Okay. Yeah. And so like, if there's something that I don't understand, I'll be like, okay, first of all, representational state transfer. Do you understand that? No. Me neither. So we can make a mental note that we don't know what that means exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and then software architectural style. Sounds like you're not familiar with that concept yet also, right? Correct. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So when I'm reading documentation like this, I like to just go through and be like, oh, what specifically do I not understand? Um. So maybe we can come back to represent representational state transfer and mm -hmm. we can focus on software architectural style for now. As we can see there, it's a link. So maybe let's click that and see what it shows us. All right. 
Okay. And it looks like this takes us just to a section in the software mm -hmm. architecture um, Wikipedia article. Okay, so let's just do the same exact thing. Why don't you read that first sentence and we'll see what we understand and what we don't understand. An architectural pattern is a general reusable solution to a commonly occurring problem in software architecture within a given context. Architectural patterns are often documented as software design patterns. That okay. one's, yeah, pretty, pretty more straightforward. Okay. All right. If you feel good about that, then I guess we can return to the article we we're just on. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry. Maybe we can hit back a couple of times to get yeah. back to the HTTP article. Yeah. Or to the go. rest article. Okay. Um, and then let's focus on representational state transfer. I happen to see under that heading of principle, it says a little bit more about it. So how about let's, let's read that one aloud. The term representational state transfer was introduced and defined in 2000 by computer scientist Roy Fielding in his doctoral dissertation. It means that a server will respond with the representation of a resource Today, it will most often be an HTML, XML, or JSON document, and that resource will contain hypermedia links that can be followed to make the state of the system change. Any such request will in turn receive the representation of a resource and so on. Okay. What do you think about that passage you just read? Yeah, I yeah, I think I'm following that. Okay. Um let's talk about what a resource is. Do you feel like you have a firm grasp on what they mean by resource? Not in this context. Um thinking it's like a link or Yeah, that's that's my only guess. That's what I would have thought. Okay. Okay, let's go deeper into that. Um, I'm looking for other instances of resource. Okay, so it says a representation of a resource. Today, it will most often be an HTML, XML, or JSON document. That's a clue about what resource means. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that resource will contain hypermedia links that can be followed to make the state of the system change. Okay, do you know what a... Hypermedia link is. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm not sure that I know what a hypermedia link is. Um, but what's your understanding of what a hypermedia link is? Is it not just like a a link that will direct you to uh different medias, like uh to help you navigate through stuff in a document? Well, if that's what it means, I don't know how that's different from just a plain old link. Mm -hmm. So maybe let's get a firm grasp on the distinction between a link and a hypermedia link. Okay. Um, so why don't we just Google hypermedia link and see what we get? See. Oh, here's a clue right here on the right. Hypermedia, an extension of the term hypertext, is a nonlinear medium of information that includes graphics, audio, video, plain text, and hyperlinks. Okay. Nonlinear medium of information. Hmm. Every time we encounter a term, it's defined in terms of other terms that I don't yeah. know the meaning of. Happens a lot. Um, okay. So this thing that says rest with hypermedia, hot or not, that doesn't really seem like a definition of um, hypermedia link. So let's keep going down and see if there's anything better.
There we go. What is hypermedia? You want to open that one up? Sure. Okay. Okay. Why don't we uh, start reading that that first paragraph? Yeah. Right here. Yeah. These diverse types of interlinked, nonlinear, accessed media forms are called hypermedia. As software architecture, architect. Good luck. Or, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, he explains, hypermedia is the matter of which the World Wide Web is made. Much like the physical world is built of interacting elementary particles, the web is essentially a universe of myriad interacting hypermedia documents. All right, I just got to pause and say, fuck you, Irakli Nadarish Vili. Because <laughs> he's like throwing in these terms like bosons and fermions. It's like, that's yeah. so irrelevant. And it's like, who knows what a boson and a fermion is? And that's like so irrelevant. Um, okay, so like, I'm guessing there's a much plainer way that we could that we could state what hypermedia is so it's like okay much like the physical world of is built of interacting elementary particles so he could have said like much like the physical world is made of atoms or something like that yeah um, yeah got, the like, web is essentially blocks. okay and instead of saying essentially a universe of myriad interacting hypermedia documents, you could say the web is basically made out of hypermedia documents. Okay. And I suppose a hypermedia document is like an image, an HTML document, an XML document, whatever. Oh yeah, it says hypermedia transcends hypertext the word suggesting that more than just text is capable of being hyperlinks, such as graphics, videos, and music files. Oh, okay. And then, and then in the next paragraph, it says, in essence, then hypermedia is just another name for everything we see here and interact with on the web. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, so I guess a hyperlink, even though it doesn't explicitly say it, I guess a hyperlink must be a link that links to some kind of hypermedia. So I guess a hypermedia link is, in fact, just the same exact thing as what we call a link. All right. Okay. So uh, I just have to say bad job Wikipedia for throwing in that unnecessarily complex word right. for hypermedia link when we could have just said the link. All right, so let's go back to um, the rest page. There we are. Okay. Okay, so Jonathan, after all that, how about let's read, let's reread this first paragraph under principle. The term representational state transfer was introduced and defined in 2000 by computer scientist Roy Fielding. In his doctoral dissertation, it means that a server will respond with the representation of a resource. Uh, today will be most often be in HTML, H XML or JSON document, and there, that resource will contain hypermedia links that can be followed to make the state of the system change. Hmm. Uh, any such request will in turn receive the representation of a resource and so on. Okay. So did any of this stuff, now that we went and learned some stuff about hypermedia and such, do you did that advance your understanding of that paragraph we just read at all? Yes, it did. Okay. 
In what way? Uh, that, uh, in the sense that the hypermedia links are going to have um, yeah, that they're going to have links to uh, different places within the <clears throat> that will. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. Maybe I don't know exactly how to explain it. Okay. Yeah, isn't it funny? It's like you read something and it's like, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. And then it's like, okay, what does it mean? You're like, uh, don't know. <laughs> Um, okay. So let's, let's continue to try to make progress. Um, maybe we can go back up to the top. And now that we've read some of, um, some of what's under principle, we can understand this a little bit better. So what we were doing just now was we were trying to figure out what's meant by representational state transfer. So I personally am still not totally clear on what representational state transfer means, but we at least know that that term was introduced and defined in 2000 by computer scientist Roy Fielding. So it's the name of this thing, whatever this thing is. Um, how about Jonathan, let's, let's reread that first paragraph and see if we understand it any more clearly this time around. Yeah. Uh, representational state transfer is a software architectural style that was created to guide the design and development of the architecture for the World Wide Web. REST defines a set of constraints for how the architecture of a distributed uh, internet scale hypermedia sense system, such as the web, should behave. Uh, the REST Architectural style emphasizes uniform interfaces, independent deployment of components, the scalability of interactions between them, and creating a layered architecture to promote caching to reduce user perceived latency, enforce security, and encapsulates legacy systems. Okay. So it's okay if the answer is no, but did you get any additional clarity Same. on that read? No. Okay. Um, let's continue reading then. Um, and before we continue reading, um, do you understand the distinction between the internet and the web? No, I don't actually, I can't explain the distinction between the two. Okay. So my understanding is that the internet is basically the network of all the computers in the world that can talk to each other. Um, but the web is just um, the part of the internet that you can like see in a browser. Okay. My, my, my definition I just gave there is not precisely accurate. Um, but that's basically the, the idea. So like, for example, you could go on like some kind of text-based chat somewhere like, mm -hmm. um, oh, I don't know. Like there's, there's like terminal-based chat programs. Mm -hmm. Um, and like you could chat with people on there and you're using the internet, but you're not using the web. Right. Yes, you're right. Yeah. You know what? Let's click on that World Wide Web link there. Because, like, the, the internet dates back to the 60s. But the web, as, as it says here, it was only open to the public in 1991. So let's read this. Jonathan, how about you read that first paragraph here? Yeah, the World Wide Web is an information system that enables content sharing over the internet through user-friendly ways meant to appeal to users beyond IT specialists and hobbyists. 
It allows documents and other web resources to be accessed over the internet according to specific rules of the Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Okay. Also known as HTTP. Okay. Um, any reflections on that? Uh, yes. The uh, yeah, it sounds like the web is more user friendly for the internet, mm -hmm. and that it was made for the masses instead of people who had a special interest in it. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. Um, I'm just gonna read this. Mm -hmm. Part of it here, documents and other media content are made available to the network through web servers and can be accessed by programs such as web browsers. Um, this is interesting. Okay, I'm looking at the third paragraph now. The original and still very common document type is a web page formatted in hypertext markup language, HTML. Obviously, everybody knows what HTML is, but... It's rare that that we go and like research these very fundamental things. Um, but I think it's actually very useful. Um, like it almost seems like a dumb question. Like like it it, it seems kind of dumb for us to be reading this Wikipedia page for the World Wide Web. It's <laughs> like we're programmers. Like, don't we already know what the web is? But I think a lot of people like, don't exactly have a super firm grasp of what the web is. And even though I feel like I kind of do, I certainly don't have as firm of a grasp as I could. Right. And I think that like having a really firm grasp on these really fundamental things um, helps a lot. Yeah. So if you'll indulge me, Jonathan, why don't we click that yeah. link for hypertext markup language? And just go there um because i'm curious you know obviously you're familiar with html jonathan but i'm guessing mm -hmm. you've never read the Wiki wikipedia page for html before i have not yeah That's so how first. about read us that first paragraph there sure hypertext markup language or html is the standard markup language for documents designed to be displayed in a web browser it defines the content and structure of web content. It is often assisted by technologies such as cascading style sheets and scripting languages such as JavaScript. Okay. Okay. So not terribly earth shattering news. That was kind of stuff that I already knew. And I'm, I imagine you already knew also. Mm -hmm. um, why don't we scroll down just out of curiosity and, and read a little bit of that history. Okay, so Jonathan, you might remember from the previous page that Tim Berners-Lee was the inventor of the web. And maybe, maybe let's just read this first paragraph here because I think it's maybe kind of interesting to, to know where this stuff came from. Okay. In 1980, this is Tim Berners-Lee, a contractor at CERN, proposed a prototype Inquire, a system for CERN researchers to use and share documents. In 1989, Berners-Lee wrote a memo proposing an internet-based hypertext system. Berners-Lee specified HTML and wrote the browser and server software in late 1990. That year, Berners-Lee and CERN data systems engineer Robert Kalui Kalua mm -hmm. Collaborated on a joint request for funding, but the project was not formally adopted by CERN. In his personal notes of 1990, Berners Lee listed some of the many areas in which hypertext is used. And Encyclopedia is the first entry. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. I was kind of familiar with the origin of, of the web. Mm -hmm. but I didn't really know those details. Um, and I think now we're like straying into areas, areas where it's not super useful, but it is kind of interesting at least. 
Okay, this makes me want to click on that hypertext link. How about we do that? Um, because we keep coming across hypertext and hypermedia and such, but I don't think I have a, a, a firm grasp on what hypertext is. Okay. Okay. So, dear na dear narrator, if you would humor <laughs> us and and read this one for us. Sure thing. Hypertext is a is text displayed on a computer display or other electronic devices with references hyperlinks to other text that the reader can immediately access. Hypertext documents are interconnected by hyperlinks, which are typically activated by a mouse click, key press set, or a screen touch. Apart from text, the term hypertext is also sometimes used to describe tables, images, and other presentational content formats with integrated hyperlinks. Hypertext is one of the key underlying concepts of the World Wide Web, where web pages are often written in the hypertext markup language. As implemented on the web, hypertext enables the easy use publication of information over the internet. Okay. And I'll give you a break and I'll take a turn reading for a second because I find this etymology section interesting. Hypertext is a recent coinage. Hyper is used in the mathematical sense of extension and generality, as in hyperspace, hypercube, rather than the medical sense of excessive hyperactivity. There is no hmm. implication about size. A hypertext could contain only 500 words or so. Hyper refers to structure and not size. That's interesting because I did not know I did not know about that and I made an assumption which I think was the wrong assumption. Like I think I kind of the 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 sense in which I'm familiar with the prefix hyper is what they're referring to as the medical sense like right. hyperactivity. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I don't know what hyperspace is, nor do I know what a hypercube is. Um, so, hmm, I don't know. I'm feeling unsatisfied now because I feel like this thing, this like really fundamental thing, hypertext and hypermedia, I don't understand what hyper means. Oh, hey, okay, the, the English yes, prefix hyper right. comes from the Greek prefix, don't know how to say it, and means over or beyond. It has a common origin with the prefix super, which comes from Latin. It signifies the overcoming of the previous linear constraints of written text. Okay, it signifies the overcoming of the previous linear constraints of written text. Okay. Yeah, and maybe Jonathan, you're familiar with the concept of like a car and a supercar and a hypercar. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, car, supercar, hypercar. And so hypertext is like, okay, maybe we can put it like this. We have like a Honda Accord, that's just a car. And then we have a Ferrari Testarossa. That's a supercar. Mm -hmm. And then we have, I'm not sure what an example of a hypercar <laughs> is, but like a Bugatti. Um, oh, what is it? No, no let's say, a, a, I don't know. I was going to say Koenigsegg, but I forgot the, the model. But let's just say Koenigsegg, whatever. Yeah. Um, um, so we have text and that's like the Honda Accord. And then we can have hypertext, and that's like the Koenigsegg. Um, ah, what was that Bugatti I was trying to think of? There's the Bugatti Veyron, Chiron, Bugatti Chiron. Okay. Chiron. Yeah, that's maybe a more famous example. Anyway, um, yeah, hypertext is like the Bugatti Chiron of text. It has these like special abilities. Okay. I feel, at least for me personally, that was helpful to go through that and like 
understand conceptually what hypertext and hypermedia are. Now, Jonathan, so, let's go all the way back to the HTTP REST article. Were you going to say something? I was going to ask, uh, so is this a uh, usual process that you do when you're reading documentation? So yeah. you go and break it down piece by piece and be sure to understand every part of the written document, I should say, of the text. Yeah. Yeah. And there's kind of an economic aspect to it. Like, I can't afford to follow all the branches of the tree and deeply understand every single word. And mm -hmm. so I have to make some trade-offs. It's like, okay, well, I'm going to choose not to understand this part because I just can't afford to understand everything. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't, again, I don't follow every branch of the tree, but I try right. to pick and see which are the most important ones. And I do go deep on those ones. All right, I'll definitely have to try to incorporate that more. Okay. Yeah, and we just got a few minutes left, but let's let's go back sure. to that um Wikipedia rest page. Oh yeah, where were we? Sorry. Oh, that's okay. I think the... if you go to that what is the difference between HTTP and REST Stack Overflow page, there was a link in the comments. Oh, yeah, you're right. So about this one right here? Mm hmm I believe so. Uh, let's see. Is this where we were? Yeah, let's click on that one and then go to the comments of the first answer. Well, these are comments on the question. Let's go to the comments in the first oh, answer. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there we go. Right here. Mm -hmm. All right. Back to okay. Rest. So now for the third time, let's read this. And I'll I'll read it this time. Um okay. REST representational state transfer is a software architectural style that was created to guide the design and development of the architecture for the World Wide Web. And I'll pause there. Any additional clarity on this reading over the last time now that we've done a little more re research? Yes. Yeah, okay. now that I have a better understanding of what, yeah, software architectural style and what the World Wide Web actually is. Okay. REST defines a set of constraints for how the architecture of a distributed internet scale hypermedia system, such as the web, should behave. Any any more clarity there? Internet scale hypermedia system. No, I'm a little I'm still lost on that one. Okay. Well, we understand hypermedia a little bit better now. Mm-hmm. Um let's let's zoom in on um Hypermedia systems such as the web. How firm of a grasp do you feel like you have on that? Well, it seems like the hypermedia system is like when it's it's how it's describing the web is by a hypermedia system. And what it says internet scale means by a large like a large, uh, like a large scale, I should say. Yeah. And the hypermedia is the links, the pictures, the graphics. So what I'm not sure is when the, how REST defines the constraints. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and that's not surprising because we haven't quite gotten to that part yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, but that's good to specifically identify that part that you don't understand yet. Um, the REST architectural style emphasizes mm -hmm. uniform interfaces, independent deployment of components, the scalability of interactions between them, 
and creating a layered architecture to promote caching to reduce user perceived latency, enforce security, and encapsulate legacy systems. Frankly, my opinion, as somebody who is familiar with REST, is that's a lot of word soup that doesn't have a lot of actual meaning. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, let's scroll down maybe to the history section. Um, the web began to enter everyday use in 1993-94 when websites for general use started to become available. At the time, there was only a fragmented description of the web's architecture, and there was pressure in the industry to agree on some standard for the web interface protocols. For instance, several experimental extensions had been added to the communication protocol, HTTP, to support proxies, and more extensions were still being proposed. Still, there was a need for a formal web architecture with which to evaluate the impact of these changes. Okay. All right, maybe the history isn't super interesting. How about let's scroll down and see what's below. Okay, architectural properties. Let's scroll up just a touch. Yeah. All right, just the And Jonathan, I'll let you read that first paragraph there. Sure thing. The REST architectural style is, a, is designed for network-based applications specifically client-server applications. But more than that, it is designed for internet scale usage. So the coupling between the user agent, which is the client, and the origin server must be as loose as possible to facilitate large-scale adoption. Okay. I'd be surprised if you were already familiar with all of that. So is there anything, are there any terms in there that you weren't previously familiar with? Oh, um, let's see. Uh, like what's it referring to by client server applications? Um, and I assume like the user agent. Mm -hmm. And then origin server. Okay. Um, well, we are at uh time, okay. Um, so so let's start wrapping up. I think the main takeaway I want to give you is when I was when I was a lot younger, I would like maybe read something like this and be like, mm -hmm. "Man, I just don't understand," and I would have kind of a hopeless feeling. But then at some point, I realized that everything is understandable. It's just a question of how much time you have to put in to like follow the branches of the tree and understand the um, understand the understand the sub concepts that make up other concepts. Okay. So it's like, okay, if we don't understand this paragraph, and one of the things we don't understand is what a client server application is. Mm -hmm. No problem. We can just go look up what a client server application is. And bit by bit, we can build up our understanding. Um, so I think my homework for you, Jonathan, if if you want, yeah, is to continue going through this REST article and just try to gain an understanding of what REST is. And you can you can obviously like use whatever resources you can find like, you know, you could ask some of your professors what rest is, if you feel like they might know stuff like that. Um, you could maybe try to find some books or something like that, whatever you need to do. Um, but, but see if you can get a firm grasp on what rest is. That's maybe a homework assignment that I would suggest. Okay. Okay. And, um, do you still have my uh, my scheduling link for the mentorship sessions? Yes, sir, I do. Okay. So feel free to use that to grab another time whenever it works for you. And before we go, a message from our sponsor. Um, I want to make sure people are aware of my consulting work that I do. 
Um, Jonathan, do you happen to be, uh, do you happen to know about the consulting work that I do? I do not. Okay. Um, so the main service that I advertise is TDD coaching. So coaching for test-driven development. Um, and what some of my clients uh, find, you know, most of my clients come to me because they need help with testing, but then we find that we need help with, uh, well, there are other areas that could benefit from help too, and maybe even before we work on testing. Like Jonathan, you came to me for help with um, routing, and we actually ended up going more fun fundamental. And, you know, I'm guessing, Jonathan, you didn't expect that our session would include <laughs> you and me reading the Wikipedia article for the World Wide Web together. Right. So it's a lot of stuff like that. Uh, me and my clients start with testing, and then we we go down to more fundamental stuff. Anyway, um, dear viewer, I wanted to make sure you're aware that I make my living as a consultant and that TDD coaching is my main service. You can go to codewithjason.com to learn more about that and to apply to be a client. Um, Jonathan, thanks for joining me today, and I look forward to our next session. Thank you, Jason. All right. Talk to you later. See you.